Um, thank you everyone for making uh, today our presentation. Uh, I know like you have midterms and comprehensive exams uh, coming, so I appreciate uh, today's time. So as far as I said, my name is Lisa, and today I will be talking about the project I have been working here at U of T, uh, which is um, the, some insights about having zero occupant autonomous vehicles uh, in Toronto. So. So the outline for today's presentation is I will share a little bit about the motivation of the project, the project overview, the publication expectations, and uh, those are two. So mainly um, we will talk about the stakeholder engagement and some of the policy options that um, I have learned from the stakeholders and the, the literature and some next steps in the timeline for the project. So to start it, with the motivation, uh, new mobility services such as Uber and Lyft uh, at, by 2019 were thought to add 5.7 billion miles of driving in the most populated cities uh, around the world and similar outcomes are expected when autonomous vehicles are deployed in our cities. Uh, a similar problem um, is seen in the freight industry where empty miles or what will become zero occupant vehicles uh, trips or miles in the future of AV accounted for around 36% of trucks on the roads in 2019 in the US and 40% in Asia. Um, some of the uh, the naturalistic experiments that have been conducted out, out there for AVs have revealed that around 21% of increase of VMT is resulted from those trips that won't have any occupant in the bed. And we also know that the deployment, the usage, the operability, and in general the su success of autonomy uh, will largely depend on how cities and regions regulate its um, deployment and also how they think uh, and plan for this new technology. So for this project we thought it was essential to understand key, hold, key stakeholder uh, visions on the deployment because sometimes innovative technologies do not necessarily gel to favorable social products and um, things like transportation that really have an impact on larger um, stages like the economy and the society in general uh, might need to be regulated and controlled. Um, I also, like from the literature, uh, we also observed that prior qualitative research has not focused on the impact of having autonomous vehicles unoccupied in our roads, and I think that's a very important problem. And as of Toronto, in 2019, the city released its automated vehicle tactical plan, which outlined a vision founded on seven directions. So the first one was equity and health, second one environment sustainability, economic sustainability, privacy, road safety, integrated mobility, and transportation system efficiency. And in that one, one of the main things that they, they wanted to look at was the potential impacts associated with having zero uh, occupant vehicles in Toronto roads. So given that background, the project goal is to understand the impacts of zero occupant automated vehicles, operations in road congestion, green gas, um, and air pollutant emissions, parking, among other possible um, issues as well. So specifically for this project, we have three main objectives. So the first one is consulting and interviewing a representative range of stakeholders. Then uh, do an extensive detailed review of academic, professional, and popular um, literature concern, concerning zero occupancy vehicle scenario, um, its impacts and some mitigation strategies. And then the final uh, part of the project will involve using uh, the GTA uh, model to forecast demand and assess some minor extensions and quantify the impacts of zero occupancy vehicles, and given some of the scenarios that I, I will show uh, later in the presentation. But because of time, 
uh, and because I will be here only until December, my main task uh, was to do all the qualitative part of this study, and then the quantitative part, which will be more of the simulation, it will be something that another postdoc uh, will complete uh, starting this December. So we have different project uh, expectations and deliverable for this specific project. They wanted me to conduct two comprehensive literature reviews, one on emerging mobility issues, so more at looking what the impacts of things like Uber and Lyft have been uh, in, the, in this city, but also in other cities, and specifically to those uh, impacts that will be exacerbated when we have zero occupant vehicles. Uh, I was also asked to conduct uh, stakeholder meetings at the beginning of the project. They were um, planned for the fourth quarter of 2022 and the first quarter of 2023, but because of time we end up doing them all of in this quarter. Mm, and again, the, the analysis, the simulation analysis uh, for the different COV scenarios was another expectation some reports. I also had to um, attend some uh, city uh, council meetings and share some of the progress of this project, as well as some presentations to the city and staff. And of course, like, um, we wanted to make this a research product, so we have the target to submit one technical paper to TRB as part of this project. Let me start by outlining what are zero occupant autonomous vehicles, and sometimes people call them trips, miles, kilometers, so depending on where you are. And you will see that I had ex stakeholders from not only Canada but also the US, so I had to, to use these terms, terms interchangeably. Before getting into what zero occupant vehicles are, let me remind you uh, what autonomy will be for our study. Uh, so, I'm sure you all are familiar with this, but it's it's a good reminder. So, the Society of um, American Engineers have put together a framework with six levels of autonomy, where level zero has no automation and the driver has full control of the driving task. Level one has some uh, driver assistance, so the vehicle features a single uh, automated feature. In this case, could be an example could be cruise control, for instance. Then we have level two, which is partial automation, and in this stage, the vehicle can control the steer and acceleration, uh, but the driver can take control at any time. This will be more like adaptive cruise control, for example. And in these three initial levels, human is still in control, and most of the cars that we have nowadays are part of one of those three levels. Then when we move on to the ladder to level three, there is conditional automation and in this uh, stage the vehicle can control most of the driving task, but driver override is required and there are some examples already out there that have level three of automation, so I don't know if you were seeing the news lately, uh, maybe a month ago, a uh, deployment of GARIC technology was releasing one of the municipalities close to Toronto, and this car is already making kind of level three uh, automation um, trips. So in level four, we found like there is high automation, so the vehicle perform all dri driving tasks under certain conditions. So in case of a, I don't know, snowstorm or something like that, the vehicle won't be able to, to drive itself, so driving, uh, the driver needs to over, uh, overtake. And then level five, which is full automation, is the vehicle, uh, it's when the vehicle will be able to perform all driving tasks, no matter what the weather is or the infrastructure is. And at this point, um, researchers and the industry expect that the car won't have any wheels or pedals. I personally don't think that's going to be possible if it's not in a controlled environment, but that's just my personal opinion. And in these three linear levels, uh, we said that like, the vehicle is mainly in control. But for this specific study, and when I was ans asking the different questions that I considered for the study, I was uh, asking the respondents to set themselves in a world where level four or above uh, would be possible in the roads of Toronto. 
So some additional information that I also would like you to have in mind uh, is that for this study, autonomous vehicles uh, are assumed to be likely privately owned or shared, and that even if they are privately or shared, uh, they could be electric vehicles, but this is not conditional. And electric vehicles are, on, are those that are partially or fully powered by electricity. Uh, we also share with our participants that um, autonomous vehicles, maybe mainly when they will be shared, uh, they will be used like ride hailing, so Uber and Lyft, how it acts today, or as a full service where two riders or more are paired to use the same vehicle to conduct their ride. And finally, uh, specifically when looking at shared autonomous vehicles, there were two types of trips that are generated. One is passenger hailing trips, and the other one are those dead hailing trips that from now on we will start calling zero occupant uh, vehicles. But let me give you two examples to fully understand what zero occupant vehicles means. So in the ride hailing industry, in the current days, uh, zero occupant vehicles are called dead hailing miles. But in the world of AV, so let's say that we have an AV level four or five, it's in a parking lot and it logged in to get used. Then it's ready to be higher, but uh, it starts to cruise in for a ride uh, around the roads so that the algorithm will capture it and then assign finally a ride. Then the ride is requested and assigned to the vehicle. And then the vehicle en routes to get the passenger. It picks up the passenger and then takes the passenger from its origin to its destination until it drops off the passenger. And this cycle can repeat or, or can look differently if there are two or more passengers paired uh, in the vehicle. But at the end of the day, the vehicle will do some additional miles to go back to the parking and log out and get maintenance or cleanance or, or, or whatever the case will be. So in this specific example, when referring to zero occupant uh, vehicle miles, I am talking about those that are happening between point B and D, and point, and point E and F. So that's what I will, or we understand in this study as to be zero occupant autonomous vehicle miles. But that also happened in, in freight, and I, I told you that a little bit at the beginning of, of the presentation. So I just, put here an example for urban freight. So again, an AV level four or five, it's at a parking. Let's say the parking is at the same spot at the distribution center, so there are no additional uh, miles done there. So at that distribution center, the, the car gets filled up with some cargo and it starts its revenue miles to deliver at the first receiver. And because this is an urban freight example, this can happen uh, n number of times until the car is empty or the truck is empty, at which point the car will either go back to the distribution center to get filled up again the, to the initial distribution center, or will do some empty miles to other distribution center and fill up again. And if the system is very efficient, this can repeat throughout the day, or at the end of the day, or when the vehicle will need maintenance, it will go back uh, to the the parking to get clean and maintenance and, and so on. So from this specific example, what we understand as zero occupant uh, vehicle miles are those happening between D and E, um, D and B, and E and F. So having that in mind, uh, for this specific um, project, we have two expected outcomes. Uh, my outcomes are the papers, but at the end, I will have to just put together just one report, but I'm trying to, to make two papers out of uh, this experience. So the first one will be the one that is focused on the stakeholder engagement. So what is relevant about this paper is that there are only like 15 other similar papers using focus groups or interviews, but the setup is mainly in the European Union and Australia. and they tend to evaluate mainly AVs in general or specific to cybersecurity. So I couldn't find a paper looking specifically to the aspect of having unoccupied vehicles in our roads because they were mainly focusing 
uh, only acceptance right now. So those are the first uh, things that motivate me to have this uh, paper. And the other one is that this topic is mainly viewed from the natural experiments, as I shared at the beginning, or simulations. So I put, I did find a lot of papers uh, simulating what uh, or how many additional miles uh, the vehicles will bring to the road and how that will impact things like pollution or emissions. Uh, but it hasn't been really seen from the perspective of different stakeholders. However, to conduct this, there were a lot of logistics behind. So as you might know, since it's a qualitative study that involves uh, humans uh, participants, I had to get approval from the Research Ethics Board, and I had to have an, init an initial expectation of response rate. So for this one, I have set it to be 20%, meaning I expect to get at least 50 respondents from the 250 that I contacted. I also had to design a screening survey and conduct some online synchronic focus group one-on-one -on -one interviews. And at the end of the project, what I hope to do is a thematic analysis, identifying, identifying those different impacts and potential uh, strategies to mitigate those impacts. So the stakeholders that we involved in this project were mainly coming from three bigger groups. So public entities and initiative groups. So here we have like some university centers, government organizations, non-profits. Uh, we also have another group about consulting firms. So to name few, uh, uh, WSP, Stantec, Urban Strategies, and, and yeah, similar consulting firms. And we also have uh, some we identified 83 potential stakeholders in the industry. 25 of them were in our priority group, and I got uh, some responses from, from some, of, some of them, not, not all, but still uh, there were a lot of that were uh, willing to participate. So the data collection, uh, we decided to go uh, with two methodologies, let's say like that, so, so focus group and one-on-one -on -one interviews. So in the focus group, we included um, re stakeholders that were, were part of non-profits, the government, consultant, academic, and other industry. And for this part, we, we envisioned to have at least four online focus groups with three to six participants, and the focus group were taking one hour and 30 minutes, around one hour and 30 minutes. Then we decided for the auto, in, auto industry and the tech industry to have one-on-one -on -one interviews. And the reason for this is that we really wanted their honest opinion about some of the things. And having people around might have like um, suppressed them to share their, their views. And actually from the one-on-one -on -one interviews, I have get asked a lot. Like For this, I had to give out consent forms and they had to read it and sign it and return it to me. And in the consent forms, of course, it says like it will be anonymous and it, it, it's not meant to be shared their specific answers with anyone else. But they were asking throughout the interview, are you sure you are not going to share this with anyone? Like we want to make sure. Uh, so, so that's why we decided to go with one-on-one -on -one interviews for those uh, two specific stakeholders. So if all is as, as planned, because I haven't finished the data collection, and uh, we will have 32 participants, uh, so 12 more of the 20 original plan for this group. And then we end up doing five focus groups with 24 participants in total, which give us uh, 55 stakeholders uh, in this study uh, in a rate of response of 22%. So here is for you to see like a sample of our participants. So as you notice from the logos, they, they are not all there because I, I didn't have time to find 50 logos. But uh, we have people from industry, also non-profit organizations, uh, governmental organizations, more of academic uh, also entities. And I want to highlight like, the importance and the learning experience that I, I've had, I have gained from in interacting with all these different stakeholders. So for example, for one of the nonprofit organizations, I am interviewing a blind person. 
which really is going to give me a different perspective of not only how the technology is going to work, but as a researcher, I have also learned to accommodate, to, um, to include uh, these participants uh, as part of our research, which, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, then, yeah, as, as you notice there, I, I have some companies that are mainly like based in Canada, but others like Gatic or, or Emotional that are more uh, US based. And, and yeah. Then some of the topics that I use for the questions, uh, and they came mainly uh, from the literature, it's of course uh, harmful roaming and congestion, how zero occupant uh, vehicles are going to impact this in our roads. Another uh, issue that I identified from the literature was payment deterioration or infrastructure overuse, but also mentioning things like the changes in curbside and parking that having zero occupant vehicles would bring to, to the city. Uh, other things were additional emissions, so how also pollution is going to be affected by this, this change. And uh, we also look into safety and privacy concerns and in general li liability uh, of having zero occupant vehicles in the road. Uh, so the focus groups and the interview engagement had mainly uh, five uh, parts, they, and I will go over them one by one. So in the first part, I we did some like introduction introductions and got to know each other and discuss our daily transportation use. And really, what this helped me for was to understand if I had in the stakeholder um, participants people who tended more to be and active transportation mode user, and I have noticed that that changed a lot how they perceive uh, ADs are going to play a role in the change uh, of, in the changes that transportation may experience. And we also did some, uh, an infographic exercise to define what zero occupant vehicles were. So many of the examples that I gave to you, it's, it's also the examples that I have been giving to the stakeholders uh, that were included in this project. So then the first question, uh, try to uh, assess the, their attitudes towards AVs. And one thing that I want to share from here, and that has been surprising to me, is that some people that it's working in the technology, it's still answering, uh, are you going to use AVs for your daily uh, travel? And they were like, well, it depends. I, I'm not sure. So it's like, you are working in the technology. You are you are you are supposed to be selling it like all the good things about it, but it's still even them uh, are not that confident how it's going to everything is going to play out. So it has been very interesting. And the third part was mainly looking at the concerns, uh, the concerns of having zero occupancy vehicles in our roads. So we had questions of how that would change the transportation landscape in general. But then I was going specific and, and trying to ask them where, which of those changes they, they perceive as a more positive thing or negative thing, or also how that would change if it's allowed in their area, for example. Uh, some other questions include um, how they envision this is going to affect and produce other transportation externalities like pollution, uh, what is the impact in infrastructure, parking, then a more specific question about parking, uh, because I realized that when, as, when asking about parking specifically, people was um, focusing their responses a lot in downtown, what will happen in downtown with parking, uh, but then we were also interested in how that's going to play out in the bigger, uh, in the greater Toronto Hamilton area as well. And the, the last question was also uh, a very enlightening one when respondents uh, were giving me their answers because a lot of people have different opinions about uh, how safety is going to change when autonomous vehicles are in place. So I, I will share a little bit of that in subsequent slides. So I, at the end, I also asked 
then uh, strategies that we could use today and in the future. And then we were concluding the focus group with suggestions or, or final comments. So as I mentioned, uh, I also gathered some additional information from our respondents with a screening survey. And as you can see here, we had a lot of people working in the tech industry that has been part of the um, engagements. Uh, and the other industry is actually consulting because I, for some reason I forgot to put that uh, as, as an option for the survey. And then we also saw that uh, most of the people uh, being part of the engagement were managers and the others were like policy strategies or, or policy analysts working in these different um, industries. We also asked uh, how many years of experience they have worked in, in transportation and we also asked if they had had any involvement with projects that um, work towards uh, understanding the impacts of autonomous vehicles as well. So what have I learned so far uh, from, from the focus group? So, so I, I wanted to put together like a work cloud so that to show you of the different things that we have been talking about and, and one that it's very like involved there is people. So, and especially from the focus group, I have seen that people has become really mindful of the problem that will come with the interaction of the different road users. And I think as a, as a researcher that, that has also been like a good learning experience to know that still we, or whoever is planning this technology for us and or adopting this technology is understanding that people is central to either the adoption and the success really of the technology in the future. From the interviews, uh, on the other hand, I have seen more of like more of I will say like technical uh, concerns and, and and also from from the work cloud you can see they they were talking about like insurance uh, because. A lot of the industry is worried on how all of this is going to play out related to insurance and liability and so on. So other things that I have learned is that zero occupant vehicles, miles, trips or kilometers are called so many different things in so many different industries. So people call them unnecessary trips or pointless miles, or empty miles. Uh, so everyone has a different understanding of what they are. Uh, the respondents also reflected on the differentiation between having zero bit trips with clear goals and some without. So, when thinking about some some of those zero occupant vehicle trips without goals, will be like, for example, a car roaming to be waiting for its ride. While if you are doing those miles to go to get your passenger, that will be a trip with a goal let's say. So the respondents were saying we should charge, if if that's what the city is like, we should charge those miles that are without a goal, uh, have a penalty for them to not occur. So many respondents also point out to the need to prepare the city for more active travel and mass transportation before even caring about what is going to happen with zero occupant vehicles. And someone uh, mentioned this that I, I found uh, very interesting. Uh, actually, someone told me that I should change my whole PhD thesis to an ownership problem. And I was like, I already did my PhD, that's so sad. But uh, I, I think that's a good idea for someone working here. So the different uh, ownership models um, has been highlighted. And someone even mentioned the possibility of not allowing private ownership of level four uh, or above because we as humans tend to be lazy uh, and what happened, similar to what happened with the car, uh, we could see in the future AVs just going to pick up our groceries and dry cleaning and things like that. So that was highlighted by, by one of the respondents. Other things that I have learned is that people have pointed out that they need to start standardizing uh, things. As I mentioned, liability was most of one of the most controversial issues throughout the discussions, 
And some of the participants argue uh, that has to be responsibility from the original uh, equipment manufacturer. But others say like it's responsibility of the city because if the vehicle is connected and the marking uh, lanes are not clearly defined, then it's not our fault. So it's like passing the ball from one to another. So that has been interesting. And also some of them has shared some of the strategies uh, to control this kind of problems, and I will try to go over those on the next slide. So what will the city do to prepare? And that's thinking of the present tense. So designing training standards and request data to original equipment manufacturers and other companies that are testing on the roads. And it's important to also harmonize information across boundaries uh, because even like looking at Uber and Lyft, what is reported from them is so different in so many parts that it's really hard to understand how they are operating right now. Another thing is identify the different ecosystems that play a role in developing this technology and understanding their synergies. And when, it, when I, I mentioned the name ecosystem, uh, different thing has come from my respondents' mouths that are things like the Internet of Things, the role that artificial intelligence, intelligence plays in, in the deployment of APs, but also like things like cryptocurrency. How can we use that new technology and evolve that to make this, this system more efficient? Also, uh, prepare the infrastructure to allow connectivity, so better communication systems, payment marking, uh, and signal conditions, and so on. And as I mentioned earlier, support the idea of active transport uh, and promoting a chip to cities that need fewer cars that will be only used for cargo or, or service. Then when thinking about the question of what will the city do in the future when zero occupancy vehicles are driving, are driving on Toronto roads, for that I put together uh, that other uh, paper and this one is very short so I I will skip this to just go over the options uh, for the sake of time. So some of the options uh, have been studied uh, for the city is things like congestion pricing. And I know the city has been considering this since a very long time, but there haven't been really clear regulations about it. So we are again bringing this into the picture and because uh, throughout the focus groups and the literature, I have learned that it's important to start prepare, preparing the infrastructure to what is going to come, and I think congestion pricing can be a solution uh, to those harmful uh, miles that ZOVs will uh, put in our roads. Other things are traffic management strategies, so automated systems to manage flow, uh, accidents, and congestion. Using things like smart lanes, and especially when it will be mixed, some of those uh, scenarios could have like mixed traffic, so some vehicles being level 4 or above while others still being below level 3. Um, I think it's important that the infrastructure understand uh, those different uh, actors. So tax per mile, it's, a, it's another uh, concept that has been brought up, but one, in, one paper in, in, interests me said that tax per mile in a world where AVs will be stuck in traffic won't have really um, impact because if I am just stopped there, I won't be making any miles. So I have read of the, um, instead of having tax per mile, having tax per minute. So that we are really charging for the use of the infrastructure, uh, and that's another interesting strategy. So parking and curbside management, of course, um, with having uh, the concept of mobility as a service in in mind, also providing uh, strategies to better use autonomous vehicles as those like, shuttle services to help first and last mile uh, travel. And then the last thing will be, the last two things will be geofencing, so the use of GPS or radio frequency identification uh, devices that, so that we can control the, or create uh, virtual geogra geographic boundaries where 
speed and other things will be limited for autonomous vehicles. And then the last thing is mobility as a service from it. And this is a very interesting uh, thing that I have been reading and it came more from gray literature. Uh, that is the use of roaming, like it's using the cell phone uh, industry right now. So being able to get a hold on all the drivers, even if they are um, driving at that time for Uber or Lyft. But if a driver, let's say a driver of, of a Lyft driver is closer to a passenger that requested the service through an Uber so that the Lyft driver could go instead to pick up the passenger, so reduce the number of miles, while still providing some of that, those gains, uh, like monetary gains, to the other, uh, to the competitor in this example, uh, Uber. Then for this paper, I'm going to use uh, a methodology that is called the Synergy Framework, and I will I try to go really quick over this, so, really looking at those uh, more of emergent practices because I feel like policy has become, become a lot, what are the good practices uh, and the best practices? But for what comes, like the changes that lie ahead, uh, I don't think the good or the best practices, practices that we have right now are going to help us. So we have to come up with more uh, innovative ideas and probably those strategies that I mentioned before might need to work simultaneously so not only having one but different uh, many of them implemented in a city I think it's it's what would be the way to go and then uh, at the end what the whole uh, objective of this project and as I understand it it's as well because it's more uh, of a policy oriented one is help Toronto uh, autonomous vehicle tactical plan go to be AV ready at some point in time. Because right now, we don't even have AVs uh, being tested in the roads of Toronto, so that's a, that should be a, a real concern for the city as well. So, I have some next step for this project, and I won't go over them. Uh, also a timeline, but I won't be over, go over them. And with that, I will conclude the presentation. And if you have any questions or thoughts, I will be happy to answer those.